first two presentations were quite fascinating in the sense of the aspect of messaging or telling stories, which has to come out of your product market strategy, which I'll talk about today. And the second presentation came out of design, and he's actually a product manager, but he just doesn't know that, nor has he ever used that term. So where did the story of product management or the beginning of this conference start? It was in 1932 in a memo from Tom uh, or Neil McElroy at the Procter & Gamble Company in Cincinnati. Now keep in mind up until the 1930s, the largest organizations in the world were two types. There were either military organizations committed to performing war or the railroads. And the railroads at those times were only about 1,000 employees. But as companies grew, they had to figure out how to manage things. So they had line management, they had staff management. In the 30s, General Electric invented matrix management, where you had both a line and a uh, staffing role that you reported to. Neil said that we need what we now call the CEO of the product, but they called it at Procter & Gamble, a brand manager. And they had the responsibilities of what people today do as product managers and as product marketing managers. However, people that perform the functions and the six keys to success, which I'll be talking about in a moment, in organizations around the world, could go by nearly 450 titles. But they pretty much do the same kinds of things. Unfortunately, in order to be successful with your products, you need to have the competency to do about 130 different things. And most people don't have that, so therefore you have to put together teams that enable the future success of the product. So to begin, I'd like to suggest that we don't call ourselves product managers anymore, because you go to a cocktail party and you say to somebody, I'm a product manager, and their eyes glaze over and they walk away. Just like you go and you say you're a designer, the eyes glaze over and they walk away. I propose that everybody in this room, because you're here at this conference, which started in 1932, is here because you're interested in the success, the long-term success of your products and or your company. So I propose the chief product success officer should be right up there with the chief financial officer, you know, the chief executive officer and the chief uh, sales officer, or the chief customer satisfaction officer. And everyone below that should have the terms product success, director of product success, group manager of product success. And now people know what you guys do and where you start from. So Neil's memo finally found its way to Hewlett Packard, as I found it through my research for my books. And uh, he conferred greatly with Fred Tierman at Stanford University, who was currently mentoring six guys that were in the process of starting Hewlett Packard and a bunch of other companies, which eventually became the basis for Silicon Valley, and that's where I'm from. Coincidentally enough, I joined HP in the corporate PR department in 1980, having come there from Minnesota and Washington, D.C., working in public policy and national science and technology issues and I got the opportunity to handle the personal public relations for David Packard, the Packard of uh, Hewlett Packard. And I had the opportunity to sit next to a fellow that was a gen former general manager at uh, HP, and HP was very kind to their employees. They have a ladder type promotional system, just like the 3M company does, and one of the reasons why HP and 3M were successful for so many years. And his job was to curate the history of Hewlett Packard. And he uh, videotaped and interviewed all of the founders and all the early managers and what their philosophies were, what their management styles were, and all about the values of HP called the HP way. So one of the nice things about HP is you had the opportunity to transition horizontally. And because I had brought word processing to the corporate PR department, and it was, a, by the way, at that time, in 1980, it was the only department in the entire company that knew how to type. Uh, I was able to move over into office systems and got two products, one at the beginning of the product life cycle, a universal, 
user experience, user interface across HP terminals and personal computers. And the second one was a product marketing job to write the product introduction plan and bring a product to market, which was a report writer uh, for executives. Well, it turns out in my research that that fellow, Neil McElroy, was on an advisory committee at Harvard and at Stanford. And that's how the whole field of product management began, was at Hewlett Packard. And then a few years later, because I was a trained product manager at Hewlett Packard, Apple approached me and asked me to come to work for them because many people at Apple recognize the value of what product managers do because of HP's experience and success. In fact, a success at HP that enabled them to grow 20% a year every year for 50 years. Now, can anybody name another company that has had that level of success? 20% a year growth for 50 years. And there's two fundamental things that they did in addition to having the role of product management throughout the company. One was they never got or allowed an organization to grow to be more than 500 people because they wanted to drive all decision making as down and as close to the customer as it possibly can. And you saw the little video there of what Philips is doing, trying to get close to the customer, understanding what the customer does. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So I got technically trained there as a product manager in the marketing department, because product management by then in the 1980s had moved out of engineering and into marketing. Went to Apple, and the VP of product manage management was a fellow by the name of Steve Jobs. And they gave me the job of taking the first hard disk drive to market. It was a fantastic product. It was five megabytes in uh, uh, storage space. It was about this wide, about like that, and about like that. It was made with the ShoeGuard ST506 uh, hard disk drive. ShoeGuard also invented the smaller five and a quarter floppy uh, drive that ran on the Apple II. And uh, it sold for a mere $3,600. And they sent me to Comdex with all of the other uh, Apple employees from the Apple II division. And the company was so committed to this hard disk drive and this enormous amount of space of five megabytes, I was the only one that they sent. And I had to stand on a concrete floor for seven days in a row and give a presentation as to why people need that much space every 30 minutes. By the fourth day, I could barely stand. But the company had no commitment to the product because it was brand new. It was just out there. And now I have an iPhone in my pocket that has 128 gigabytes of uh, storage space. That's how far these technologies have come along and how hard it is to introduce a new uh, product into a new product marketplace. Well, HP noticed that I could manage, partly because of my previous experience of being able to manage, and they asked me to take over the Apple III product line, which I did. And three weeks into uh, running the product line, the executive committee decided, at Steve's urging, to cancel the product line. And they called me into uh, the president's office a couple weeks later when they realized that if they canceled the product line right then, that they will have uh, $20 million in piece parts spread from Singapore to Dallas and our manufacturing facilities. And John Scully said to me, what should we do about it? And I said, what do you mean, what do you mean we, pale face? And uh, you guys didn't get the joke, neither did he. We had a television show back in the 50s in the United States of a lone ranger who was a masked man, rode around uh, the, uh, the countryside, the west, on a, on a white horse. Uh, and he had a sidekick, a uh, Indian uh, by the name of Tonto. Now, when I'm in India, I have to say an American Indian named Tonto, so that they don't, they don't get it confused. And I said, John, and sitting there at the table was Ida Cole, who became later the international VP of Microsoft, Del Yoakum, who was head of manufacturing, and he later became president, and uh, Joe Graziano, who was the CFO, who later became uh, the CFO of Sun Microsystems and was greatly contributed to the success of Sun, which, by the way, is now owned by um, uh, Oracle. And I said, you went off on your own and you canceled the product line and you didn't ask me what we should do about it. He said, well, what should we do about it? And I told him the story of um, uh, Kelly Johnson at the uh, Lockheed Skunk Works, who I knew and had talked to previously. I told him the story of the soul of a new machine. I told him the story of how IBM, because in all of those instances, the bureaucracy of the larger organization 
The organizations that are larger than 500 people tend to drag things down. And these are small, autonomous business units that were able to perform on their own. So he asked me to put together a business plan. I did, along with 80 other people uh, in the company and a core group of seven, and presented it to the executive committee on uh, July 15th, 1983. And sitting in the back of the room was a lady by the name of Ann Bowers, and I didn't know who she was at the time uh, in terms of her, her background, but I knew she was the vice president of HR at Apple, and I also knew that she was instrumental in pushing for the Apple values, similar to the HP way. And she was married to a guy by the name of Bob Noyce, who was the president of Intel. So Intel also had technical product managers. Intel also had a set of values. It had a culture. It had a vision. And she was trying to drive that into, H, into Apple just like HP had it and to replicate the things that Apple or that HP did to have the kind of success that they had had for so many, many, many years. So one of the people that was working for me, Maxine Graham, suggested in addition to the options of what to do with the product line and that inventory, Let's not only do the P&L and the balance sheet comparison, but also let's compare it to Apple values. And that was a very strange thing for me uh, to understand, but it kind of resonated a little bit because when I started the Flying Club at the University of Michigan, uh, now it's about 46 years ago, and it's still going strong, I established a set of values and a vision which they continue to follow today, and that organization continues to thrive. They've trained over 4,000 pilots worldwide, including the head of the Blue Angels who offered me to, uh, a seat in the front row, and I forgot to ask him for a seat in one of the airplanes. Uh, so uh, the question came up if, from Floyd Kwame, who later went on to be a venture capitalist at uh, Kleiner Perkins, if the company makes a decision of uh, canceling the product line and a dealer calls you, what would you say? And if the company makes a decision to uh, continue the product line, what would you say? I said, well, if the company makes a decision to continue the product line, then I would reiterate what I learned as an aerospace engineering student when I went to see the Apollo 15 take off, and then they took us over to the, the Disney World, and the Imagineers there, and they don't call them engineers at uh, Disney or designers, the Imagineers there uh, debated uh, the question that one of my fellow students asked is, where should we put in the sidewalks? And of course, the Imagineer says, well, we got to put them here, got to here. I mean, we're designers. We know exactly where people are going to walk and everything. And one of the junior Imagineers said, don't put in any sidewalks. And that was blasphemy. How could you build a huge world-class amusement park and not have any sidewalks? And then that young Imagineer said something that every one of you must remember as you leave here. We are not smart enough to know what people want to do what the market wants to do. Let the market decide itself. So let's plant grass, and after three weeks, let's see where the paths are in the grass, and that's where we put in the sidewalks. Fast forward, I'm at Apple, running the Apple III product line, and the business students there, we had lots of MBAs, Apple paid everybody 40% more, higher than the curve than anybody else in the valley because they wanted the best and the brightest. Those MBA people had never conceived of the concept that there was a market which we today call small office, home office, and small and medium business. And because they could not conceive that those market segments existed, therefore there was no need for the Apple III. And they helped contribute to killing their own. So back to my story, Floyd says, what would you say if we continue uh, the product? I say, I would tell the dealer, it's perfectly okay, we'll continue the product line, so long as you guys sell it and support it and the market continues to buy it. However, if you make the decision to cancel the product line, if you look right here on this little matrix of all the <coughs> Apple values, it's in conflict with about two-thirds of the values that you teach us the first day and we discuss when we join the company and go to Apple University. If you make that kind of decision that is so contrary to the values that you claim this company stands by, I won't answer that dealer's question. I'll give them your phone number. And the exec executive committee laughed. They thought it was funny. But I made my point. 
that all decisions on products, all decisions on design is always made against the backdrop as to what the values of the company is. And it was the HP Way values that enabled that company to grow 20% a year for 50 years until Carly Farina joined around 96 or 98, being an ex-salesperson from the old AT&T, she had to have control, theory X of management. She sucked everybody and all the decision making in from the divisions and all the decisions were made at the top and the company has been spiraling down into almost oblivion ever since. So I'll come back to that story in a little bit later and when I close. So the key to all of this is becoming more successful with the products that we have. In, 19, in 2014, the Battelle Institute did a study and they found that the world spends about, spent in that year $1.6 trillion in research and development for new products. But about 35 to 45 percent of them have failed according to a study by a couple of professors of the uh, University of North Carolina, which you can find on the internet. That means close to around 0.5 to 0.75 uh, trillion dollars are wasted every year. Can you imagine if some or all or most of that waste is actually turned into profitable products and returns a, an investment back to the investors, how many more people could be employed, how much better productivity and how much le less waste there would be in the world. And that's why I'm here today. I've been doing this stuff now for 47 years, including Apple and HP DataQuest, 11 startups, over 75 different products and services, hardware and software, B2B and B2C. And I wish I knew a fraction of what I know today when I started doing this 47 years ago. So I'm here to help share with you the results of my research in terms of the six keys to having successful products and to help you remember it, you could use the acronym SPICES, hence the name of my company, Spice Catalyst. And I'll talk a little bit more about these in detail. First is the strategy, and we heard uh, Michael quote uh, uh, um, the uh, VC firm saying, if you, you can't have a story unless you have a strategy, where I'm gonna talk here about the strategy so that you can develop that excellent story that Michael was talking about. Then you have to have a process in order to build your products. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Then you have to have the information available in order to make the right decisions. Then you have to be uh, focused on your customers. And I'll build upon what Pierre said in terms of observing, which is the aha moment that I had uh, a few years ago after reading Helmont um, uh, Essinger's book called Keep It Simple. Helmont was a designer for Sony in the 1960s, Sony style. And Steve Jobs, being the calligrapher that he was originally trained to be, he hired Helmont to do the designs for Apple. And just coincidentally enough, when Hel Helmont finished his white, uh, Snow White design language, I was invited to a meeting with Steve and my other senior uh, fellow product managers and division managers, and I walked into a room and Mariani building, and it, had, it ran from about that podium to that wall, and they had a long table laid out with a white tablecloth over top of it, and you could see little bumps under there, and you're wondering what it is. And they started slowly rolling back the curtain, showing us the designs of disk drives, monitors, hard drives, computers, and so forth. I brought to market two or three of those products. And I had no idea what was going on at the time because in my engineering school, design was never discussed. We were just building things. But in the design thinking world, which was just beginning to develop then, it was being done. And then another great book to read is Tom Kelly's book on uh, uh, design innovation from IDEO. Turns out they designed several of the products uh, around the Apple III that I also brought to market. So I had that, that kind of um, impact, and what design people do is they act like social anthropologists and they go out and observe first before they start interviewing and doing market research. The fifth thing is the employees. And I mentioned earlier there's 130 different competencies that an organization must have at a low level, basic, intermediate, and advanced in order to succeed. 
And the last thing, which is also important, is the systems and tools to get the job done. Most of you probably use such things as HP Word and Microsoft, or I mean uh, Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel and some email system. Those are tools that were designed for something else, not for the successful management of products. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So strategy are these things here. Understanding what your customer does and then doing it faster, better, cheaper, with style and with innovation. That's where the innovation comes in. But you can't do the innovation unless you clearly understand what is it that your customer does. I love the quote about getting a, uh, building a bridge or getting across a river. How many people have heard the story about Henry Ford went out and allegedly and asked people, would you like uh, uh, to have a car? How many have heard that story? And the response was, no, I don't want a car, I want a faster horse. Should have asked the question, do you want to get from point A to point B faster? And then you could start designing on it. Look at the railroad business, at least in the United States. They decided they were in the railroad business, not in the transportation of people and goods business. If they had, they probably would have gotten involved in building highways, cars, trucks, buses, and so forth, but they didn't. And in the United States, the entire railroad industry almost collapsed a couple of, uh, several decades ago. Look at Eastman Kodak, for example. Once a huge powerhouse, I forget exactly, I think they had like 70,000 employees in Schenectady, New York. And I know a little bit about them because I was handling PR for Lexar Media and we licensed our technology for digital film to them. But the bureaucracy at Kodak says, no, digital film will cannibalize our film business because we are in the film business. Can you imagine how big Kodak would be today with that brand name if they defined themselves as being in the business of the capture, storage, retention, search, and display of images, not still images, not moving images, all images, and it didn't matter whether it's on film or digitally. They'd be worth a whole lot more than the billion dollars cap that they have today, which is a, a, a shadow of what they used to be. So understanding what your customer does intimately is key, and then you do your market research and your competitive research and you do your competitive research not on the basis of what the pro product is that they have now while you develop a product, but also in terms of where you project they're going to be at the time of your announcement. Because the market changes, especially in this agile world. And then you borrow a concept from marketing called personas, and you write the personas to give to your engineering team so that they know who they're building the product for. One of the first things I did when I took over the Apple III product line, I went down into the basement and I talked to a fellow by the name of Jeff Raskin. Jeff was the architect of the Apple III. Steve Jobs was the product manager on the Apple III. In fact, his title was Vice President of Product Management at Apple III. He had budgetary authority, something that's been taken away from product managers over the years, and I argue you should ask for it back, just like Neil McElroy's brand manager. They had budgetary authority over the advertising budget, over the marketing budget, over the market research budget. They could get the job done because they had the authority to go along commensurate with their responsibility. And you have to have that balance in an organization, otherwise you lead to less product success. So take those personas and go to engineering and say, this is who I want you to build the product for. And I asked Jeff, who I mentioned is the architect of the Apple III, he was also the architect of the Macintosh, I said, who did you build this product for? He described in great detail the small office, home office, small and medium business market that the MBA wizards never learned at Harvard or MIT or Stanford because they never, no one had defined that market or market segment yet for them with the top-down thinking as opposed to the Disney bottom-up type of thinking. And then Jeff said to me when I was done chatting with him, and I was asking him the same questions about what kinds of customers he had in mind, what were the personas, he says, you know, I've been here for four years. Uh, this was in 1982, so he'd been there since like 78. He says, you are the first person for marketing to ever come talk to me. Can you imagine that? The marketing department wasn't bothering to talk to the engineering department 
who were doing the design thinking at Apple at the time, and they constantly fought. Are we an engineering-driven company, or are we a marketing-driven company? And it went back and forth and back and forth, and it got to the point where Apple, after Steve left, didn't care about design anymore. And if you look at the images of the Apple Macintosh computers, shortly after Steve left, they all begin to look like the industrial designs of the IBM PC, which is quite surprising coming from an architect by the name of John Scully to just throw away the whole concept of design in order to help differentiate the product and help the product do what people want to do better. So those same personas, if used for product development, it's easily transferred over to marketing to be transferred into the stories that Michael was talking about. But all too frequently, the things you see up here in terms of the product market strategy is done about 30 days before the product is announced. And they come to consultants such as myself, and there's a number of others in the room, and they say, hey, we just finished building this product, now go find some customers. And you say, well, who did you build it for? I don't know, figure it out. And that's where the whole concept of personas came from before. I suggest it could be taken out of marketing and used as part of the product market strategy. Then with all of that information in hand, you can put together a compelling value proposition. And I propose to you, you cannot write such a value proposition or a marketing canvas or a product canvas or a business canvas with one or two sentences until after you've done the hard work of this kind of stuff which will take typically three to six months. You have to have the discipline to get that done. I know, I've tried writing such canvases without doing this research, and you just sit there and go, I don't know. And you end up putting down glittering generalities, which means nothing to the marketplace. Then and only then can you position the product in the marketplace. And you don't do what is taught by many of my compatriots in product management. They say just take two axes, uh, pick whatever axis you want and put yourself here in the, the what is it, the upper uh, right-hand corner, put everybody else here, therefore, aha, we've positioned, we're better, faster than everybody else. The axes you pick will go back to your research on what people do in terms of not only how important is it for them to do those things, but what's their general satisfaction with the current ways of getting that done. So you may end up with a radar chart that has four, five, six, seven, eight different parts to it, and then you hit can plot on there where your competition is, and then you pick the ones in which you are better off at than the other ones, and that's how you position your product in the marketplace. So you pile all this stuff up, all the do's, all the jobs, which are collections of those jobs, all of the outcomes that people are trying to accomplish, into personas, aggregate them into target market segments, and those into markets. And a market is a place that you go to. Marketing, and that's what this is all about, a product market strategy. A product marketing strategy is how, after you've defined all this stuff, you take it to the market. And that then enables you to do the product roadmap and to implement. The second thing is process. You must have a process for what you're doing, and it must be repeatable. And there's lots of stuff written about having a mature, repeatable process. Uh, one of my customers, Miru uh, uh, Networks, they do hospital and education Wi-Fi devices, and they had developed five products, brought it to market, they all failed. And the VP of product management said to me, he says, what's going on here? I said, well, we have to do an assessment across these six things, and then we can come back to you and uh, tell you what's going on. We got to the end of this assessment, he said, you don't have a process that everybody knows and understands and agrees to. He says, oh my God, that's right. Without a process, he said, we develop a culture of blame. So every time one of those products came out and it failed in the marketplace, everybody inside the company blamed somebody else for the problems. Not a great way to develop teamwork. You need a framework to follow in terms of your process, and I'll show you one that I've developed which takes into account things like Agile um, and the uh, customer journey and uh, the digital revolution, and you can adopt it and modify it any way that you want. And you need to have a DACY or RACY chart, which I'll talk more about in a moment, and that gives you a culture of success. What this 
Daisy Erasy chart says is that not everybody in the company is a decision maker on everything. You have a decision maker, one. You have a driver, usually the product manager. You have people that you just keep informed, but they can't make the decisions. And you have one that um, uh, is responsible for uh, uh, just contributing to it, and providing information. So I was teaching the Botswana Telecommunications Company in uh, Botswana, and uh, a, a senior product group product manager was there from a South African bank. He said that his product line, he got a call about halfway through the course, that his product line had just been canceled. What should he do? I said, well, what happened? He said they hired a new general manager. She came in, said, we don't think we should have this product, canceled the product line. The 12 developers were just totally frustrated. Their guts were on the floor having worked on this for 18 months. I said, if you ha did you have a DC or AC chart? He said, no. I said, if you had, would her, was her, would her name be on there? He said, no. So I propose you put this chart together before you begin your product market strategy. You get an agreement from everybody that's on that chart as to what their role is, decision maker, contributor, informer, or driver. And then up there in the right-hand corner, it has a signature line. You go around with this thing with a pin, and you prick people, and they have them sign it in blood. And you stick this on top of all of your artifacts as you go through the product process so that he could have gone back to his president and say, wait a minute, why are you letting her make this decision? She's not even on the chart. And all of those people would still be working at that South African bank now. Since then, they've all left because they became disillusioned. The next item is information. You got to have the information necessary in order to get the job done. Frequently, the market research is done by a different department in a large organization, and they are attuned to the annual budgets, not to the needs of a product market strategy. You got to have the right information at the right time, and it's also useful to have some sort of portal where all, those, all of this information is kept. And this is how you start the innovation process. You go out and observe, ask people, or watch what people do, why they do it, when they do it, where they do it, how they do it. Then you write uh, an interview uh, uh, tool. You go out and interview people to validate what you've observed. And then you do a representative sample for a survey, and you use the previous work to refine that questionnaire, and you survey uh, a representative sample that you could then project onto your marketplace and use it for sales forecasting. And then now with big data and the use and searches for keywords, you could use that for product development. What problems are people using keywords to search for in order to solve? You need to put that all together and now you can lay the groundwork for the innovation. That immediately translates into what the customer value is going to be and the value proposition, which is usually the thing we all choke on when we sit down to write our stories or our messaging and we start making this stuff up. That then lets you do, as you can see down in the below there, positioning, uh, enables you to do the marketing plan and so forth. The E of spices is employees. And you have to have core competencies in all these areas, and I mentioned there's 130 of them. When I first started writing uh, foundations and the successful management of products, and there's a flyer in all of your bags, which will be out soon from uh, Wiley and Sons, uh, I had no idea that there was 130 competencies. I would have guessed there was about 20 or 30. And lastly, systems and tools. One of my students uh, in India uh, worked for a company that's a premier JIRA uh, a supporter and maker, and he's written a JIRA plugin uh, called Productize, uniquely enough the same name, but he came up with this name about a year and a half ago. And I'll offer that JIRA plugin to anybody in this room that would like to use it for free for a year. Just connect with me on LinkedIn, and it's just under my name. And also, um, I'll offer a copy of my book, Building Insanely Great Products, which is in final formatting right now, be available through uh, Amazon for free to anybody that connects with me on LinkedIn. I'll announce the availability of it for a day or so, and then you can go download it. So let me close by asking two questions. Um, I saw a movie a few years ago uh, called I Am. It was a producer 
famous Hollywood producer that was in a bicycle accident and he was laying on his death bed in, um, uh, in the hospital wondering why he was here. What was his useful contribution? It was asked that um, uh, he, he noticed that zebras in Africa, they move around, one of them changes and everyone follows along called networking. You know, his birds tended to communicate that same way. So then he asked himself, and I ask you all the same question, who is the most important person in your company or organization? Anybody? Who? Shout it out. The CEO. The CEO. Who? The client. The client. Who else? The customer. customer. You're all wrong. You are. I am. You should all say, I am the most important person in the company. Who is the worst person in your company? I am. You are. So quit your whining about not having the authority to get the job done and do what I did and go ask for it. And you'll be surprised. You'll get the authority. You'll get the budget. And if you want to be able to do that same kind of presentation that I did on July 15, 1983, that enabled me to produce enough profits for the company to employ 1,000 to 1,500 of the best and brightest in Silicon Valley until the company forced me to shut the product line. And all those people that were complaining about my product line having no place in the mar marketplace, they all got laid off. You can do the same thing. The presentation is available up on uh, my website for free. All I have to do is change the names and, and, and the story, and you can go ask for the authority too. You are the most important people in the company and your organization and for your product if you decide to take charge and go do it. Thank you.